Hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, I hope you are staying safe and healthy. Welcome to the Voices of Sustainability virtual fireside chat series. My name is Anya Sitharam, I'm a former BBC World News presenter and ITN health and science correspondent, and I now make documentaries specialising in global health, science and environment. In fact, for the last 20 years I've been making many global health documentaries filmed around the world, uh, some on infectious diseases, health systems, and that very crucial subject about access to healthcare. Now, the Zayed Sustainability Prize was established in 2008 as the United Arab Emirates' pioneering global award for recognizing organizations and global high schools for their sustainable, innovative, and humanitarian solutions. Today, the prize counts more than 14 years of global impact with 370 million people around the world benefiting from its winner's solutions across the categories of health, food, energy, water, and global high schools. In today's episode, we will delve into the topic of healthcare access for all. But first, I'd like to introduce our guest speakers. We have Guillermo Pepe, who's founder and CEO of Mammotest, an assetless, patient-driven digital platform defeating breast cancer, and the 2022 Zayed Sustainability Prize winner in the health category. Guillermo founded Mammotest to decrease the high breast cancer mortality rates due to lack of access in underserved populations. Mamotes collects medical, clinical, psychological and socio-economic data. That broader scope with 100% patient traceability allows them to put vital information in the hands of global business and policymakers, giving them the power to save hundreds of thousands of women's lives. Um, we are also joined by Dr. Gerard Kraus, who is head of the epidemiology department at Helmholtz Center for Infection Research, which is a 2023 Zayed Sustainability Prize finalist in the health category. Dr. Gerard is a medical doctor and professor for infectious disease epidemiology. In diverse leadership positions in public health and research, he's helped to control epidemics in Africa, the Americas and Europe. And in 2015, he invented the Surveillance Outbreak Response Management and Analysis System, or SORMAS, and has led its development and implementation in five different WHO regions. So we're having this conversation on the occasion of Universal Health Coverage Day, which is recognized every year on December the 12th. And we're amplifying the message that everyone everywhere deserves access to quality health service without financial hardship. According to the World Health Organization, at least half of the world's population cannot obtain essential health services. And the pandemic has slowed progress towards universal health coverage. And the problem is further compounded by the impacts of climate change, which include, as we know, warming temperatures, drought, or increased rainfall, rising sea levels, and increases in the frequency or intensity of extreme weather events. And these impacts threaten both our health and our livelihoods. And if we're to prevent future pandemics and achieve health and well-being for all by 2030, which is the aim of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, we must be willing to invest more in health and allocate resources efficiently and equitably according to need. So how to do this efficiently and capitalize on the numerous levers to address health access for a rapidly increasing population, which is now 8 billion, and of course the changing climate. Well, that's the focus for today's episode. So let's start our discussion and uh, I'd like to invite our speakers in. We're gonna look a little bit about the challenges now in achieving that goal. So uh, Dr. Gerard Krauss, 
with COVID-19, we saw an explosion in the number of studies and the role of epidemiology <clears throat> in better understanding and responding to the pandemic. And you oversee the development of the Surveillance Outbreak Response Management and Analysis System, or SORMAS, a tool that aims to improve prevention and control of communicable diseases, particularly in resource poor settings. So first of all, just tell us a little bit about how SORMAS works and how it's especially valuable for protecting health in so-called last mile communities. Yeah, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. So essentially what distinguishes SORMAS from many other digital tools in the health area is that it focuses very much on the response management to epidemics and on the interruption of transmission chains, infection chains. And that is a truly preventive measure. So um, we try or we aim to reduce the number of cases that fall ill in the first place. And that will inevitably also improve equitable access to healthcare because you have a smaller load of healthcare to deal with. Um, and the way it works, it's a digital tool. And the second special thing about it, it is designed in a way that it works also in very remote areas of the world where you do not have constant electricity, where you do not have constant internet access, even where you do not have constant mobile phone access. And we have, there's a patent also related to that, we call it the LBDS patent, that allows the exchange of data that is necessary for this approach, even in conditions where you have not even mobile phone network available. And the combination of those two design features, you know, the management feature, organizing response on one hand and allowing information management, even in areas where you don't have communication infrastructure available, that makes it powerful, especially in areas with very poor resources, but not only reduced to that because SOMAS is also used in industrialized countries like in Europe. So how, how does it actually collect that data? So that then is, of course, a patient attending the health clinic, the public health office, uh, the dispensary, the pharmacy, uh, whatever it is. And then the pharmacies, the labs, the public health officers, the nurses, the physicians, the border control people, all those different professions, they are connected to SOMAS. They use SOMAS themselves as a dedicated interface. And whenever they come across a specific information that is relevant in this context, they enter this data into the system. And then immediately those who need to know also will get this information immediately. So that's maybe a third interesting feature that the transmission direction of the information is not vertical and hierarchical, but it is constructed in a network pattern so that immediately all those who need to know will get the information. And also the tool allows for tasks to be given by those who need to execute the task. And this allows this, this network kind of pattern. So if there were a disease outbreak, I suppose it would show where the outbreaks are and how it's spreading. Is that is that the idea? Yes, but the special thing is it doesn't only show where it is, it also organizes the response. It organizes the people, it tells the specific contact uh, officer to go to this village and interview the neighbors of that patient. It makes sure that the lab sample gets shipped to the proper laboratory and that the result of the laboratory uh, examination gets shipped back or sent back digitally immediately to the nurse in the frontline public health office. Uh, so that is what, what distinguishes SORMAS from many other tools. It is really about the management of activities and not only about the exchange or the display of information. So obviously it was used during COVID um, uh, yes. and other diseases beforehand because obviously it was 2015 when you first yes. invented it. So the trigger was a drastic, tragic Ebola epidemic in West Africa. I was called by a former colleague who was working in the crisis center in Nigeria, and she consulted with me about the challenges that they encountered. And that's where the idea was born to build a completely new system that integrates data processing and management of activities in one tool. Since then, it has helped to detect and also to control uh, some of the historically biggest outbreaks of monkeypox, of Lassa fever, of measles, meningococcal disease. And when the Ebola epidemic, when the uh, COVID-19 pandemic came up, then many more countries joined because they wanted to use those features. 
So an incredibly important tool there. Thank, thank you. We'll come back to you in a minute. Um, so I wanted to bring uh, Guillermo Pepe in now and your organization aims to uh, extend healthcare coverage to all women, particularly underserved women of Latin America. So what are some of the biggest challenges you've been facing in providing access to these women and how have you overcome these obstacles? Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, we are starting in Latin America, but of course we want to, to go uh, everywhere in the world. Um, the the, the, the uh, barriers we've been um, uh, facing in, in, in the last 10 years uh, in order to, you know, to decrease the number of women dying of breast cancer were mainly two. Uh, one uh, is lack of early diagnosis. As you may know, uh, 700,000 women die annually because of breast cancer. 70% of those deaths are in developing economies. And this is mainly because there is a lack of early diagnosis. If, we, if women would have uh, early diagnosis, 98% of women would save their lives. Uh, but what we learned after, during our this 10-year experience, is that it's not just early diagnosis. One is the early diagnosis, but the second one, and especially in developing economies, is uh, that even when women are diagnosed at an early stage, they fall out of the system. Why? Because it's not just diagnosed that you need in order to, to fight breast cancer. You need to have additional uh, um, testing like biopsy, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, having appointments with uh, an oncologist, uh, following a treatment, uh, getting uh, resources to have that treatment. So we learned that women also have that kind of problems. And uh, so the, the, the two main problems are access to early diagnosis and making sure women can get to a treatment on time. So uh, those are the, the two main barriers we were facing. And those are the barriers that we are um, defeating in order to save women's lives in, in Latin America. So uh, is it being introduced as part of screening programs or how, how, is, how does it work? Does a woman find a lump and go forward and can have a mammo test? How exactly is it used? Yeah. What we do is um, today, because of course we pivoted our business model in order to, 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 to be more, to reach more women. Um, but what we do is we connect our platform. It's a digital platform that get connected to a mammography unit. Uh, usually that mammography unit has to be digital or digitized mammography unit. Uh, and we start designing and implementing screening programs locally. Uh, you know, in developing economies, the problem is that most of those countries, they don't have a screening program national, at the national level. So what we have to do is go locally, work locally, uh, we connect our the, the mammography units to our platform. We design and implement those screening programs locally. We um, start educating women so they know they have to offer a mammogram yearly once they are 40 years old. Uh, and when women go to those mammography facilities, they have the mammogram done. We don't need medical doctors on site because of course we are using teleradiology in order to do the diagnosis of those uh, mammograms uh, and using artificial intelligence also in order to have a, a second read of those mammograms. So it's a human plus artificial intelligence uh, diagnose. Once we have the report back, we can we are able to identify women at risk of developing breast cancer and we start helping them get to every step of the process until they get to a treatment. If they need a biopsy, we help them get a biopsy. Um, um, an ultrasound, a breast ultrasound, get appointment with mastologist or oncologist. And once um, they know what kind of treatment they have to, to have, we help them get to that treatment on time, of course. So we do that very efficiently. We shorten times from uh, awareness to diagnosis to getting a treatment on time. Uh, and this is how we uh, are defeating breast cancer in developing economies. In my introduction to you, uh, I mentioned that you collect a lot of data and different types of data. And so uh, sort of how valuable is that proving? And, and also what are the ethics of collecting that? Yeah, well, data, it's key to, to defeating breast cancer. Well, actually, for, for 
one, one of the problems, in my opinion, one of the problems that we faced during, during COVID was the lack of data, right? The, there was no connection. And that's a problem we have in the healthcare system in general, not just in developing economies, but worldwide. There is a lack of information. We don't share data in general for many reasons. Uh, so what we are, once we saw that with COVID, we realized that we had to um, to use to to use a data to have this hundred percent traceability of the patients during the entire patient journey from awareness to diagnosis to getting a treatment and how patients were responding to that treatment. So um, we could, you of course, structure that data in a way that could be of use for the industry. Uh, anonymous that data, of course, it's always anonymous data. And we can start you know, using that data to develop better drugs, to develop better treatments, to even design and develop better medical equipment. Uh, not just based on data available from Europe, US, and Japan, where it's very normal to find data, but also data available from developing economies, uh, which are not usually available. Most of the time in Latin America, you wouldn't access high quality data. That's that's a huge asset, isn't it? Because you know they you hear about data deserts, and to be able to get data at the local level in some of these very remote places is probably a huge asset for you. Um, so let's talk about <laughs> the issue of funding, and I'd like to bring in Gerard as well now. Um, so of course we all know the most important challenge to ensuring universal healthcare is funding. So. What about um, uh, you running an SME uh, Guillermo and uh, what sort of challenges do you face in terms of funding? Well, we, we face huge challenges in terms of funding, <laughs> especially in Latin America. Uh, there is a, a funding desert in Latin, in Latin America, I would say, uh, and, and uh, especially in healthcare. It is uh, a, an industry that really lacks funding in, in Latin America. Uh, so it, it was a huge challenge from, uh, for us since we, we started back in, in 2013. Um, uh, but I, we, we focused on you know, delivering results, on, the, on, the, on showing, um, you know, working on pilots and showing that um, uh, we could deliver results, we could uh, uh, save women's lives. And by doing that and, and showing uh, our results, we were able to find to, to find uh, the resources we needed to start um, developing the technology we needed to develop uh, in order to do that. Of course, we also needed to be really creative and 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 use uh, all kind of resources we had at hand in order to develop ideas that were maybe. Uh, very innovative for a healthcare system, not just in Latin America, but everywhere. Uh, ju just to give you an example of this, we what we saw in data was that uh, even in, if in developing economies, patients or women in this case, don't have the resources to access high quality, uh, uh, to access a high quality mammogram, to access um, other kinds of healthcare services, if we, we were able to use, uh, they, they, did, they did have data. And data, it's, it's a, a, another way of monetizing our business model. So um, even if they don't have the resource, money, they do have data. And we could use that data, anonymized, and structure it and structuring in a way that is useful for the industry. Uh, and that was the way we found, we find to, get the funds we needed in order to implement the solutions we needed to implement at a local level in Latin America. Thank you. So, I mean, I'm going to bring in Gerard now to talk about data shortly, because clearly that's uh, what you need in epidemiology. But uh, Gerard, do you have any views about funding at all and about how financing can be raised to support public health systems, how, how it can be better financed? Yes, it's almost an oxymoron uh, because <laughs> our nowadays modern healthcare systems and health delivery or health services deliveries are all 
very much commercialized, I think almost in every country. It's nothing by itself bad, but uh, if you have a clear customer and service provider relationship and you have a customer who is able and willing to pay, then it all works fine. Now in public health, the situation is a bit more complex. Um, it is uh, the general population that is a patient. Um, and so the general population by itself is not going to pay a bill. Yeah, it is maybe the government to pay a bill and or uh, philanthropic organizations. And then there's another specific aspect and Guillermo alluded very nicely to this aspect that data, especially health data nowadays is very, very valuable and is a value by itself that can also be monetized. Um, and that is certainly true. Uh, we find ourselves in infectious disease epidemiology and in surveillance, public health surveillance, in a specific situation where this is not really possible um, for uh, numerous reasons. First of all, in contrast to a patient uh, going entering the clinic or a hospital where the patient will then agree and sign a form to agree that the data is going to be used for certain services and for certain scientific exploitation and so on, in public health surveillance, that is not the case. The patient doesn't have a choice. The patient must deliver the data. It is gov there are governmental laws that oblige the uh, individuals, the citizen, to share the data because they are not. They don't have the choice to say, "I don't want to share who I have been in contact with. I don't want to share since when I developed symptoms," because otherwise, you will never stop an epidemic that way. So, because that is so different, the uh, ethical boundaries and obligations and limitations to use that data for other purposes are much more restricted. Mm -hmm. And that also means that the business models must be different. And that led us to the conclusion that we opted to have a spin-off that was not aimed to be commercialized, but to be non-for-profit. So we created a non-profit foundation that will maintain, curate, and stimulate the community around SOMAS. That doesn't mean that there's no money to be made with it, but the money is not with the data. And the money is not made with the data. The money is made with the services provided around the software. So software companies that do a programming module for the software or other companies that host the server for the data for a specific government, they, of course, can then uh, receive money for their services. And that's our aim as a foundation that we will stimulate this community and this market. So it will then become sustainable. That is our vision. Well, would that be anonymized data though? Well, at the level of the public health officer, he needs to know who the person is and where the person lives that he had contact to infected case. So at that level, it is not anonymized. Right. But as soon as you get to the higher level, let's say the state level, the district level, or the national level, or even international level, then the epidemiologists do not need to know the names anymore. So then anonymized data is fully sufficient to do the work. That's really, really interesting. So um, Guillermo, Pepe, so what role do you think small organizations play in driving healthcare innovation and development? You've seen a large organization there using, using its... Uh, power and force and its size to do something a bit different what about small organizations yeah i guess small organizations play a key role in, in this case and this is because um usually we a small organization are, are much more flexible i mean we you you are more i i feel that well it's not just a feeling but it's it's a fact that small organizations have uh, more flexibility, less compliance, and uh, you can, you know, try be more creative, uh, try a small project, and if you if you fail, you can you can change pivot your business model very easily uh, and try a different solution, right? So it's more of a trial and error. You are more allowed to to fail than in a big organization. Uh, actually, failing is part of the process. So. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I guess that in, in that sense, um, you, a small organizations play a key role in order to uh, find um, solutions for uh, problems that were already there. Uh, if you compare it with large organizations, which many times have to comply and, and have many restrictions in order to do 
pilots, small projects, and, and they usually don't have the, the ability to, or the possibility to fail uh, uh, a lot, right? Um, so I, yeah, I guess it's, it's key uh, for, for healthcare system to have uh, or make room for small organizations to deliver uh, solutions uh, for, for sure. So do you, do you think you get enough support from governments? Or how, how better can government support SMEs? Yeah, that's a better question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, we don't, we don't really uh, get support from governments, uh, not in Latin America at least. Usually governments in Latin America, they don't have funds. Uh, so they just, you know, usually they, what they say, they start, they start the conversation by saying, we don't have funds in order to implement this. So, um, in that sense, we don't we don't have um, support from them. But I already told this to many ministers of healthcare in Latin America. And is you you can help small organizations and, and help yourself and help the population uh, by giving us room in order to implement pilots, to work with us, to let us you know deliver solutions, even if we have to do it for free there. At, at a public level, uh, and maybe get funds uh, in, from I don't know NGOs, philanthropy, or or investors, even investors that are uh, um, in, uh, that could invest um, using social bonds, for example, uh, to 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 make an impact. Uh, but give us room in order to deliver this solution and show the world that uh, these uh, pilots work and it could. Uh, once it's, it's proven that it works, we can we can then deliver it to at a larger level, right? It could be scaled up. So you're you're really talking about public private partnerships, aren't you? Is that what you're? Oh, what you're yeah, totally. yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, uh, Gerard, what about what about you? Do do small organisations can they fit into the the sort of work that you're doing? Well, we are a small organization, so okay, <laughs> and we enough. started even smaller. So um, <clears throat> yes, um, I think it's exactly what Guillermo said. It's easier in a small organization to find agile responses and uh, res uh, and and solutions to certain challenges. Um, you know, I told you at the beginning how it all started. It was a phone call from a colleague uh, from Nigeria, and that's how it all developed. And uh, I would never have assumed it would develop so quickly, so bigly, but uh, so 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 geographically large. But uh, yes, I I agree that small organizations are very important for this. But at a certain level of scalability, you do need a sustainable platform, organizationally and financially, and sometimes also legally. And so especially for example, in the field that I work in, in public health surveillance, sooner or later, a government must make a commitment that the government wants this specific procedure and this specific tool to be deployed and used in the whole country. Otherwise, you will have a plethora of different tools that are not compatible to each other, that run at different speed, that don't have interfaces, and then you create a big confusion. So we need, Yes, the agile approach of small units and individuals and the creativity, but at some point you need to make it sustainable. You need the full power of a governmental legal mandate and also a financial baseline to guarantee quality data security and novel technology. So you'd need sort of harmonized regulations really. I mean, especially if you're going from country to country Wonder how Absolutely, that works. <laughs> yes. But even within countries, we observe in many of the countries that we work in, we observe a situation that many different initiatives uh, want to deploy their tools and that they address maybe one specific disease. Now, typically, Guillermo will probably agree, you have vertical programs for HIV, for tuberculosis, for polio, for malaria, and each of them having their own tool. I know public health officials in Nigeria, they showed me four different cell phones 
Um, and they say, this is a phone for malaria, this is a cell phone for, uh, for dengue, this is a cell phone for TB, and each of those cell phones has a different app in order in which he includes enters data. That doesn't make any sense, obviously. And that's also one of the things that distinguish SOMAS. It's a holistic approach. We have all kinds of epidemic prone diseases included in one and the same tool. I just wanted to turn to uh, the actual, um, the topic of our uh, discussion really, universal health coverage and, and sort of looking at the COVID-19 pandemic, which exposed the, and widened uh, inequalities in achieving that universal health access. So what do you think uh, some of the lessons learned from that uh, there are to bolster health systems, uh, Gerard, and especially with all the problems I mentioned, especially in the context of climate change as well. It's, it's a huge challenge, isn't it? It is, and it is incredibly complex. And there's, I think, no easy answer to that challenge. Uh, but I would like maybe to pick just two topics. One is the issue of vaccine, access to vaccine, which became a very prominent topic now during the COVID pandemic, and which brought this whole topic of patent and so on into discussion. And the other one is a topic of antimicrobial resistance, where there is no valid market incentive to develop novel antimicrobial drugs. Why is that? Because if a company actually succeeds in inventing and developing a novel drug that is far more effective than the existing antibiotics, this medical medicine will be kept in reserve in order not to generate novel antimicrobial resistance. And that means that the company is not going to sell a lot of that drug, which means that the whole investment of development will not be returned in investment as hope, because nowadays investors uh, expect a very rapid and soon return of investment. And that is a problem. So the normal uh, mercantilistic or commercial incentives in healthcare are sometimes maybe counterproductive for innovation and also counterproductive for disease prevention and certainly also counterproductive for equity in healthcare access. Yes, so, so big challenge there to overcome. And, and uh, what about you, Guillermo? What, what, what do we learn when it comes to delivering healthcare in some of the most vulnerable communities? Well, uh, I, I guess I, I said in the beginning, I, I, I also share Gerard uh, opinions on, on that. But just to add something, it's um, what I, I believe that, that what we learn is that we need the data, right? Uh, data, it's very important uh, in order to develop uh, and design and develop solutions. And I think um, COVID-19 was, uh, I, I would say, a wake up, wake up call, right? For the healthcare system in general worldwide, uh, because we, we, even if if I would I would say that before COVID nineteen that healthcare in general was behind every other industry in terms of uh, using and spreading the use of technology worldwide, with COVID we started you know thinking and implementing uh, um, technology in healthcare. We started to understand that we needed to uh, use that technology, implement that technology, and share data in order to develop these better solutions, to improve the solutions that we have at hand. So uh, I guess COVID was a wake up call. I always say that it's uh, that, that the uh, 2019, 20, 2020 was, was, it was a, a, an awful year, of course, but it was, um, uh, an, inf an inflection point in healthcare worldwide. I, I always say that for, for healthcare, it meant the, it's the equivalent of the year 2000 for internet uh, because it, it was like the year when everyone started to think about uh, solutions that could, could be implemented worldwide to start speaking about solutions like Gerard was speaking uh, that could be uh, uh, implemented at a scale and, and to start sharing that data, stop, stop wake, uh, working in silos, because health, healthcare was working in silos, and still is, but less than before. And, and we, today, we know that we need to share that data, uh, and, and we need to start implementing and using technology in order to, to have, you know, to, to, to have this uh, access 
to everyone worldwide. I sense that despite the huge challenges that we are facing as a result of COVID, I sense a, a optimism with both of you really, that we can overcome those challenges. Um, and one of the uh, words that you brought up in, in the conversation earlier was sustainability. And I, I really wanted to ask both of you, and I'll start with you, Guillermo, because you're, you're there. Um, I'd like to ask you each to share in just one word, so it's a bit of a challenge, how you would describe the future of sustainability. Um, I would use the word believe, believe. Uh, that, that would be a word that I would use uh, to describe the future of sustainability. We have to believe that we are capable, capable of developing sustainable solutions, uh, especially when we are speaking about health, uh, healthcare for all, right? And that's optimistic as well. So yes, optimistic in tone then. And Gerard, over to you now, that one word. Um, far away, is this one word or is this two words? Well, I would say far away, very distant. Right, so okay. Wait, I'm not so optimistic. <laughs> not so optimistic, okay. A bit of realism there as well. But anyway, thank, thank you so much. Um, thank you both of you for your expertise and your valuable insights and in taking part in this session. And just, uh, I'd like to thank the audience as well for watching. And um, just to let you know that if you want to watch the entire session, it'll be posted on the Zaid Sustainability Prizes YouTube channel. It's been a pleasure to host this session. Thank you very much.